Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Santosh Dikshit. I represent Persistent Systems. Uh, uh, very happy to be here. I want to thank Sean, uh, Diane, Kavi, Des. Uh, I have only flown 10,000 miles uh, to be here, uh, but I think uh, it's really a, a very good two days of learning experience. Uh, yesterday, one of my colleagues talked about what Persistent has been doing for uh, I2B2. I want to first start with giving some more granular details. Uh, there are almost like a five-year uh, project commitment partnership through Persistent. It started with our co-founder, uh, founder rather, Dr. Anand Deshpande, himself a data scientist. And uh, he's very supportive of these open source uh, activities. And I think I2B2 and Persistent mm -hmm. found a good match with each other. What we have been doing is uh, there is a dedicated team in Pune, India, uh, which actually creates a lot of these platform features, as you can see. I'm not going to read out for lack of time. Uh, but this, this is a continuous lights on project. Uh, we have commitment to continue participation. There will be dedicated resources. And we also look at the I2B2 network to sort of propagate few of our ideas just to see if there is uh, a certain traction to further the persistent cause. Couple of interesting areas of discussion Kavi mentioned about uh, machine learning and other activities. I think these would be some future areas where we would like to be involved. Uh, I think discussions are already happening, but uh, even uh, anybody else in the I2B2 consortium, if you have certain ideas where you need a industry-based implementation partner, I think we would be very happy to consider ideas and figure out a way to, uh, to work together, right? Uh, so again, big thank you to I2B2 for giving Persistent a forum. I also want to talk a little bit about Persistent's commitment to healthcare life sciences research. Uh, I mean, we all know we are in a domain which is knowledge heavy. Uh, the knowledge is constantly moving. And I sort of quickly summarized my understanding of the landscape. Uh, I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, I'm in Boston. What am I talking about, right? Uh, but technology is improving. Maybe in maybe six to seven months, you may have quantum coming up there on the left-hand side. There are significant changes happening in the central column, which is the medicine column. That is reflecting in the healthcare life sciences industry. Uh, tremendous regulations are coming up. You saw the European Union coming up with the AI regulations. There is a White House regulation. FDA recently has come up with a public source white paper to regulate Gen AI. So a lot of regulations are coming, but there are also local contexts. So for example, how do you regulate this kind of a work in different geographies of the world? And then what are the different contexts with re reference to data from different populations, et cetera? So those are some mind maps. And lastly, from a, uh, even from an academy or business point of view, uh, how do we strategize? How do we put priorities, et cetera, right? So that is how Persistent looks at the landscape. Particularly in the last one year, Persistent has put together what we call as a generative AI task force. Uh, I happen to be a part of that task force. This task force is a combination of data scientists plus domain scientists coming together. And broadly, this is the remit of the task force, the slide that you see. Uh, I think everything on the left-hand side is known to all of us as part of the community, where we are looking at uh, sort of new sprouts coming up, uh, ideas, business, partnerships is the AI toolkit. And I guess everybody is talking about the AI toolkit one way or the other. My particular role is to work very closely with data scientists and try to look at practical business use cases uh, that can show the value of generative AI, AI whichever the tool that we are looking at, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about few of our use cases that we are finding traction with uh, our partners. Before that, uh, again, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think the field is very fastly moving towards multimodal data. It's an understatement. It's already sort of, uh, uh, it's flooded with multimodal data. The data goes all the way from the genome all the way to the phenotype. We just heard about phenotyping with generative AI, et cetera. However, the biological truth lies in bringing as many data points as possible, and that's why we are thinking of multimodal inter integration. Honestly, uh, it has not been a, uh, I mean, it's a complex problem. It has not been solved yet. So anybody who claims that they can do multimodal integration, I think we take it with a pinch of salt. But that is where most of the clinical trials are going. You will see for a single patient, you will have multiple biomarkers coming together. And then finally, that process goes to the business mile, which is the translational outcomes that we talk about. I'm particularly going to focus on precision medicine today, uh, being the theme. Uh, but point is, Persistent is also dabbling in many other use cases, all the way from population health, uh, uh, even to some extent, we are doing some regulatory support and so forth. So if there is an interest, I can talk about other activities offline. 
And in doing so, what we do at Persistent is we know it. Uh, the way we innovate is we look at open source data, and I think open source movement has to be thanked here. We look at typically Creative Commons 4.0 uh, publications where we can utilize the data. And then looking at what happens in the market uh, or what is the real industry requirement, we talk a lot with end users, and we create what we call as accelerators. And these accelerators are MVPs, minimal viable products, uh, which actually show proof of concept that you can solve a problem with either AI, generative AI concept, et cetera. And then we show these models or these display cars, as we call it, to our potential customers, and that is how we uh, start interacting with them. Broadly, uh, we have looked at the entire gamut, right from omics to uh, patient personalization to real world evidences, et cetera. Uh, that just gives us a good uh, global understanding and gravitas of the healthcare ecosystem. What I want to talk about is the precision medicine part today, and I'm going to take oncology as a use case. Uh, I particularly come from an oncology background. I'm not a medico, I'm a PhD researcher, but I have been in the area of translational oncology for a long time. Uh, we all know that uh, there is a tremendous increase in the cancer burden. At the same time, there is a big shift in the way patients are treated. We all know personalized treatment, precision medicine, et cetera, these are becoming well, they have already become common common terms. But more and more, we are seeing uh, explosion of biomarkers, all kinds, uh, genomic, protein, imaging biomarkers coming together. But there is a problem. Uh, there is explosion of data. Uh, that data obviously needs to be integrated. That means multimodal data integration. And then how do you derive the biological truth? So the Kaplan markers that we all see in oncology, are they really true reflections of the underlying biological phenomena? Or are they only capturing a segment of it? I think that is where the, the real challenge rise in the oncology field right now. So it is, this slide summarizes the problem. Uh, you have on the left hand side, large amount of different data sets. Uh, every few months we have new omics coming in, great value shown by omics. The mind map of a clinician, obviously you have to treat, you have to treat fast, you have to treat accurately. You also have to worry about medical legal uh, issues about wrong treatments, et cetera. You know, it's like a complex mind map. So why not use technology to leverage uh, and to make this sort of uh, mind map much more easier, streamlined, et cetera. And that is exactly where uh, Persistent has decided to play, uh, to create assistive tools or technologies with the help of generative AI, so that ultimately the ecosystem can benefit to, to create better workflows. So what we have created, uh, again, it's not a product. We are not a product company, we are a services company. We have created a platform which we call as Precision Oncology. This is our flagship program uh, where we are constantly innovating. Currently, we have created these four pillars. The first pillar is all about uh, physician-patient interaction and how do you capture the audiovisual text, convert it into some kind of a structured text and do EMR popular, uh, popularization. Uh, again, I'll show some demos here. The second is using large multimodal models, particularly for <clears throat> radiology, pathology images, and convert to image to text kind of analysis, so that your first draft uh, gets generated fairly fast. You still leave the control to the human expert. Uh, the third part is automated medical writing, very popular theme in the field right now, where uh, you can do key entity extraction from your original source of documents and populate into some template. Uh, we are seeing tremendous uptake from the pharma industry to do uh, common technical documents for FDA, regulatory submissions, writing clinical trial protocols, a big demand for doing automated medical writing. And finally, I would say esoteric but very important is to do evidence-based medicine approaches. So we all know in evidence medicine it is the balance between safety and efficacy that determines the choice of the drug. And particularly when you have genomic or protein biomarker, how do you uh, make selection of a drug using appropriate evidence markers, et cetera. Now this requires complex knowledge synthesis. And that is where we apply knowledge graphs with generative AI to determine the relationships between such big data. And lastly, to stay with the ecosystem, uh, how do you also honor insurance claims uh, by looking at genomic biomarkers, uh, how you can derive medical terms and then cross-match with the MediClaim, Medicaid documents, et cetera, right? So as you can see, this is a modular platform. Uh, thankfully, we are getting good traction. There is a lot of industry partnership, either to the entire platform or to parts of this platform based on a, uh, on a case basis. Uh, this is, like I said, I think this is a working platform. Uh, maybe let me go to the video and I'll come back to talking about a little bit more.
introducing Precision Medicine, an end-to-end -end automated solution designed to revolutionize cancer management with a personalized approach. Powered by generative AI technology, our workbench assists healthcare professionals in making informed decisions, accelerating the entire process from diagnosis to treatment. Imagine a patient presenting with symptoms of breathlessness and chest congestion. The doctor with patient's consent records and uploads their conversation to the EMR console. It converts the conversational speech to text output feeding to generate electronic medical record that is EMR. Further, the doctor refers them for a chest CT scan and the technician uploads the images to our workbench. Our chatbot AI assistant, along with an efficient large multimodal model, identifies abnormalities in the patient's chest and provides information about probable treatment options. The technician can then export a draft report and share it with the radiologist for authentication. Our smart report builder feature helps doctors convert the draft report into a universally accepted format using natural language processing. It extracts medical entities and segregates them according to labels, allowing doctors to choose or remove suggested entities and manually add additional ones as needed. The Smart Report Builder also provides doctors with the opportunity to edit the generated report before mailing and downloading it. Based on the identified abnormalities, the doctor suspects lung cancer and prescribes a lung biopsy. The technician uploads the whole slide image of the histopathology, which is divided into smaller chunks and selected based on quality parameters. Our AI assistant confirms the diagnosis of lung cancer, and the draft report can be mailed or downloaded for authentication by the pathologist. The doctor again employs the smart report builder to generate the final report, indicating the possibility of insurance reimbursement based on the analysis of molecular testing and CPT codes. The patient is diagnosed with lung cancer with no mutation in the EGFR gene. Now the doctor uses Biomed Insights, a chat-based interface linked to biomedical literature from PubMed. The doctor rapidly gathers scientific evidence of approved therapies for lung cancer having no EGFR mutation with citations. He then considers exploration of either Pemetrext or Gemcitabine. The doctor uses our knowledge graph platform, OmniKG, to identify a chemotherapeutic drug based on safety and efficacy data retrieved from databases like Hechenet, Civic, and the FDA. OmniKG responds with chemotherapeutic drugs, their evidence levels, and liver toxicity information in a tabular and interactive knowledge graph format. Our Toxibuddy virtual assistant provides information related to the toxicity levels of FDA-approved drugs, and another chatbot allows doctors to compare the myelosuppressive potential of two drugs. This information is obtained from FDA drug labels with proper citation to avoid hallucination. By analyzing safety and efficacy evidence, doctors can make informed decisions about the best treatment choice for each patient. In conclusion, our Precision Medicine Workbench, powered by LMM, NLP, and GraphDB, enables healthcare professionals to accelerate disease management from diagnosis to treatment with a personalized approach using vast medical knowledge. So uh, this is our playground. Uh, we are trying to expand by bringing more use case verticals and also trying to go deep into each of these functions. Uh, in this process, as an industry, we have been able to uh, create very good relationships with all the hyperscalers, Google, Microsoft, AWS. That way we are cloud agnostic. But um, our observation is that these clouds are also look looking for meaningful use cases to, to sort of further their cause, to show that you know uh, their investment into technology can be brought to life. And I think that is where they are looking for these kind of use cases. Uh, this will continue to be our, uh, let's say, investment into R&D as we go further. And for the last two days, I've been hearing so many great ideas. There is a roadmap at, at uh, I2B2 into integrating LLMs or LMMs, et cetera, bringing a little bit of a regulatory component uh, because that will be soon the need of the hour as we go into this field. Uh, we see a very fertile playground for persistent to bring more value to the I2B2 network. And with that, I'd like to, again, thank you. A uh, lot of people from my team have contributed. I want to acknowledge each one of them, a large group working at Persistent.
and also a lot of people here, uh, my colleagues from Persistent who have been part of the journey. Uh, short presentation, for lack of time, I'll not go into detail, but if there is any interest, I can connect with you all uh, offline. Uh, thank you so much. Happy to take questions. So I'm kind of comparing a little bit of this to uh, self-driving cars because it's there's a bit of overlap as far as like lives and, and risk. Um, in self-driving cars, they've kind of found that uh, due to hallucination, I mean, it's not called the same thing as self-driving cars, I don't think, but due to hallucination um, and cars just making wrong decisions, there's kind of an, an understanding that you're expected to keep your hands on the wheel and some cars like enforce this and they, they kind of help make sure the person is engaged with the driving situation. So if the car starts to do something re really silly, they can correct. Have you guys considered that here? Is there anything you guys have in place or you're thinking about putting in place to sort of like make sure a doctor's attention is really being applied or, or you know, it'd be really easy for a doctor to kind of skip over a single word and then think that the diagnosis is accurate, but it was like actually hallucination or something. Yeah. Um, first of all, nowhere do we claim that this platform or any of this module is going to obviate the human expert. It's an assistive tool. Uh, we use a lot of the technologies that are available from the hyperscaler. So for example, we use some Google, uh, Medgemini, et cetera. We got access. We use chat GPT, et cetera. Now they themselves have intrinsic limitations up to 90, 95%. So we are not claiming that we are getting accurate. In the last module, to answer your specific question, the evidence-based medicine. Uh, typically, when you prescribe a drug associated with a certain biomarker, you would look for a clinical trial, class A or class B evidence, and maybe uh, from a liver toxicity point of view, there is a DELE marker. DELE stands for drug-induced liver injury. So I couldn't show it in the knowledge graph here, but I can actually uh, calculate uh, the DELE index uh, coming from the FDA database for that particular drug against that particular schema that I have determined. And because these parameters are objective parameters defined by research, experimental research available in data sets, that is where the, the doctor can actually rely on those parameters. So for example, when you know the delay index of a drug associated with a gene, the doctor knows that this is the choice of the drug, et cetera, right? So, so that level of benchmarking has happened to certain modules, nodules of what you just saw here. It's not possible to, to do at every stage because the technology is not completely foolproof here. So the best choice here is to leave the human expert. If you saw in every uh, function that you saw, we leave the, the, the human expert to take the final decision, whether it is a medical report, whether it is uh, creating the audiovisual text, et cetera, right? So I think that is the best safeguard we have brought in right now. Uh, but I mean, the question is valid. It's never going to be 100%, you know, you'll still have. It's a tricky thing to maneuver. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you very much, Santosh. Right. Um, appreciate it. Let's give Santosh a round of applause.